I'm about 18, 19. I uh, started playing the Black Sox. We played and went to different towns and things where we got called names. And, and I was happy, and I was with all these older guys. <laughs> because that was a sense of safety. Things were said that were not the kindest. I mean, jungle bunnies and all that kind of stuff. Oh, and field was no problem. I mean, I never heard, you know, nobody on the field ever said anything. And I, I, I never forget in Holland, uh, this guy Van Dyke, I think, and he had the home run, and I got around the third base, and he said, hey, uh, you doing no catch? He threw me that curveball. <laughs> Game was over, and we stopped at a restaurant, and, and you know, Things weren't that great. I could see people, some bushes out, you know. And uh, some of the older guys said, hey, uh, let's go. Uh, well, you know, what was crazy to me was here we had played this game. They had uniform numbers with our names. And you're going to do something crazy? Didn't make sense. It was dark and it was just uh, an unfriendly situation. First thing you learn in baseball is how to duck. That's one of the lessons you learn. And so uh, you had to learn how to duck and to always be ready. High and tight, some folk always had something high and tight coming at them. Brush back, noun. A pitch aimed close to the body, the batter must step back to avoid it. We knew what not to do. At that time, prejudice and hate was so strong that we had to be very careful where we go or, or what we said, and we were aware of that. We were traveling as the Detroit Stars as we would go into the South. We would experience many situations that uh, were somewhat different than what we had to experience here, up here. We could not go into restaurants and sit down and have a meal. Playing baseball in the South, you know, you're going to be... <laughs> we was called a lot of things down there, man. You know, you were a, you know... Well, for instance, we go into a store and you have to go to the back. Water fountains, colored water fountains, and uh, you know, white. It was different, you know. So my uncle, he's got to be 87, almost 87 years old now. We go in the store, and this young kid called him a boy. And you know, we didn't allow that up here, you know. So I said, what? I said, do you see how old he is? My uncle instantly took me and put me in the car and say, I'll take care of everything in this store. Because he knew that that was a sign of trouble. If the kid's dad had a came out, I don't know what they did to me, you know. And at that time, back in 58, 59, they were doing detrimental things to black people down south, you know. It wasn't nothing wrong with hanging one. We have to understand, the United States was under a pattern, 1896, when Plessy versus Ferguson was ruled on that Southern states had the right to segregate people uh, under state laws. Well, that pattern existed everywhere. See, once the Supreme Court ruled on something, that meant that it went into the culture everywhere. So from 1896 until 1964 and 65, with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Segregation was the pattern of American culture. You really, really, really have to understand there's no easy time about race in America. Um, and I think we need to c continue to remember that in the context of baseball. Baseball is a part of all sports. People wanted to see good baseball and 
if the team that played good baseball happened to be black, they were willing to watch that, here in West Michigan at least. Now that isn't to say there wasn't discrimination here, there certainly was. Um, you know, there were still plenty of stories of, you know, they had to be out of certain counties by dark, and so if a game ran late, you know, then the sheriff would es escort them to the county line. If you went to a ball game, uh, whites and blacks did not mix together in the stands. They sat in separate sections. So there was clear segregation. There was a team here that was sponsored by Jess Elster. Elster comes to Grand Rapids in 1904, and by 1960 he's organized a team, which was fairly early in the story of, of amateur baseball to have a black team playing at the amateur level. There were a couple of black pro teams playing. There was one, the Chicago Colored Giants, that later moved to Big Rapids, and then later after that moved to Adrian. They were In Adrian, they were sponsored by the Adrian Page Fence Company, and they toured the country in their own railroad car, and they're quite well known. Jess Elster is a Kentucky railroad porter who catches the eye of a Grand Rapids furniture company owner offering him a job at his factory. At the time, didn't know anything about baseball, but he fell in love with the game. Within two years, he becomes the manager of the team. He bankrolls the team by buying uniforms. He arranges games for the teams. And initially, the team is called the Colored Athletics. And then over the decades, they come to be known as Jess Elster's Colored Athletics. And in fact, he becomes so synonymous with baseball that uh, here in West Michigan, he's known as Mr. Baseball which is very unusual for an African-American ball player because generally communities had a Mr. Baseball and they had a black Mr. Baseball. Jess Elster was Mr. Baseball and Elmer Stoughton was the white Mr. Baseball. He pitched and played every field position, but first and foremost, he was looking to make money. In the springtime, almost every year, in the 20s at least, he would lease Ramona Park, which was the big ballpark in West Michigan, for his uh, weekend games. He liked playing in ballparks because then you could charge admission because there was a gate. If you played at parks like Johnson Park, then what you did is you passed the hat and, you know, it was usually a 60-40 split. The winning team got 60% of whatever the gate was and, and the losing team 40%. If you brought in a decent team, people would show up and you could make a lot more money. Toward the end of the 20s, some of these players would be making $25, $30 a week playing baseball, which in the late 20s was a ton of money. That was a, that was a lot of money for a young guy, white or black. Elster books a white team from Pontiac, Michigan, whose pitching rotation included Eddie Sycott. Eddie Sycott, who had pitched for the Chicago White Sox during the infamous Black Sox scandal. He was one of the eight who was banned from Major League Baseball for throwing the World Series. The owner of the park, who had a minor league team, said uh, he can't play in this park because he's banned from Major League Baseball and this park is part of Major League Baseball. And Elster says, no, I have a lease and it doesn't say anything in the lease that you can uh, veto who plays here. And this went back and forth in the paper for a week, you know, drumming up interest uh, and people wanting to see the game. And, and, and Alster finally said to the guy, well, what's, what's the problem with Psychot Cy pitching here? And he says, well, he's banned by baseball. And he said, well, if that's the rationale, why are you letting my team play in your park? Because my whole team is banned by baseball because they're black. When baseball really jumps off in Grand Rapids and the early part of the 1900s uh, of the 20th century. It's a segregated reality. In the South, uh, segregation is uh, explicit, open, bylaw, Jim Crow signs, separate, white, colored, all of those things. In places like Michigan, where there is no legal apparatus, it is uh, the cultural way of excluding. One, by ethnicity, two, by attitudes, uh, if you were a black person in Grand Rapids deciding to go to the movies, although there was no law in Michigan that stated that you had to, you were culturally expected to sit in the balcony of the theaters. And so by 1927, there's a famous lawsuit here uh, suing uh, the Keith Theater regarding this. And so baseball was one of the few venues because it made money for people, for businessmen who owns teams, um, that uh, black men got a chance to uh, get some mobility. Anything to get people to the games is what he was up for. When his team traveled, it generally traveled with a jazz band. So there would be jazz music before, during, and after the game. Whatever he could do to sell tickets. In the 20s, he orders a, a uniform for his team that's very, very colorful. Red and green and blue. 
uh, all in the same uniform. The larger society had these stereotypical views of African Americans, and he would play to those stereotypical views. For instance, uh, African Americans were supposed to be very superstitious. And so one year, somebody asked him in the early 20s, do you have a rabbit's foot for good luck? Well, he actually hunted rabbits in the fall, and he said, yes, I do. Every year, the story would become more and more outlandish, and, the, and these white news reporters would write it down like, well, you know, these superstitious African-Americans do this kind of stuff, so it must be true. I, I remember one year, it was the, the right hind leg of a rabbit that had been shot at bent midnight on the shores of the Dead Sea, having eaten only a diet of four-leaf clovers. And people believe that. I mean, come on. First of all, where would a rabbit on the shores of the Dead Sea, how would a leg from that get to, the, get to West Michigan? Elster owns and operates his team until his death in December 1950. One of his fielders, Ted Raspberry, also has an entrepreneurial spirit and a motivation for creating opportunities for black players. There's a young guy that's just come into Grand Rapids in the middle 1930s from Mississippi, Ted Raspberry, who played the infield, a little bit of outfield for Elster. Also very entrepreneurial, has a restaurant. He came here in 1935 and he brought baseball with him. He had a team in Mississippi called the High Steppers and he loved baseball. I give my uncle a lot of credit for second base. I thought he, um, he took a lot of time with me at second. In his living room, we wore out a rug, getting a double play. I was getting a double and going over the back, and we wore out a rug in his living room. He never forgot that, you know, but he knew I could get the double play. I knew him personally because he and I were first cousins. He was very, very instrumental in helping me develop my life. The very end of the Second World War, he decides that he can make some money running a team, but a professional team, not an amateur team like Elster's. You know, a team of guys who are gonna play ball, period. They're not gonna do anything else. And when they're not playing ball, they're practicing. They're not working in a factory. And he puts together a team called the Grand Rapids Black Sox. Henry and Johnny and everybody, all the young men, Ted got them involved in baseball. It just so happened that I'm the first born in the family. So I got involved in doing the paperwork and things like that. Ted had the ability to talk with or deal with persons from all walks of life. Raspberry seeks out a business partner, Frank Lamar, who sponsored a number of teams in the 1930s when he owned and managed the Chicky Candy Bar Giants. Lamar owned a nightclub, the Horseshoe, and the Lamar Hotel, catering to African-American travelers. In 1946, the Grand Rapids Black Sox take the field. Raspberry and Lamar form the Midwest League, touring with the Chicago Giants, along with teams from Racine and Kenosha, Wisconsin. Well, it was segregated because of the housing. I mean, you know, uh, no matter what income was or housing was limited in terms of where persons lived. My father, he graduated from Davenport Institute, which is now Davenport University, and uh, he did well academically. And, but when it came time to get a job, he was offered very little. And in fact, the job he was offered paid less than he would make it as a barber. Dan Gross's father moved his family from Oklahoma to Grand Rapids in 1947. They lived at 418 Granville Avenue above their barber shop. We lived upstairs, yes we did. Mm -hmm. That was not uncommon because uh, there were a number of people who used to live over businesses and uh, housing was uh, quite limited. And uh, I guess one of the reasons is that it wasn't open housing. And also, I guess it had to do in terms of uh, money, in terms of where you could go. Well, African-American families lived just like everybody else. They tried to buy a house. They couldn't get it loans from the banks. They got loans from more people who owned gambling establishments, the local underground gambling economy. 
they borrow money from those kinds of people because banks, uh, frankly, would not lend money to African-American homeowners. Or they bought money that they had from their farms in the South. They brought it with them and they paid cash out for houses, sometimes too much. That's how they managed to live and to create a small community, a black community. There was railroad tracks, there were railroad trains, and back of a house, uh, you go out the back, and there was the Collins Coal Company, and uh, you know, there was the mounds of coal and all that kind of good stuff, and it provided a place for us to play ball because it was wide open, pretty flat, and so we'd get back there and play ball. We used to have the Youth Commonwealth over on Wealthy Street, and uh, they had a baseball team and started playing baseball with that team. Uh, I think somewhere between the ages of 10 and 12. I used to pitch and sometimes play first base. Fastball, curveball. Didn't know anything about a slider. Might have threw a change up by accident. Basic two pitch person. My senior year, I was playing this uh, team, the Junior Elks. I fractured my tibia. I ended up staying out of school year because I was on crutches. I played, I think, at the community college one year. Then I uh, started playing the Black Sox. It was a mixture of men and young guys. And so it wasn't overly loaded with uh, younger guys. It was men. And I guess that was the greatest transition of moving from playing against boys to men. I mean, you know, strength, speed, all those kind of things that made a difference. The simple fact of the matter is these black teams were good, and if you wanted to test your mettle in baseball, you played a good team. Nick Maben, for instance, who was this phenomenal pitcher, because of the, the deformity to his hand, that white teams would hire him to pitch for them in important games that they wanted to win. They could offer him $25 a game, which, you know, was better than a week's wages anywhere else. As a young boy, uh, a, a pot of hot soup or something got spilled on his hand and it, the hand didn't heal properly. The skin between the fingers webbed when it healed and the skin between the inside of the fingers and the palm webbed. He was very self-conscious about it. Any picture you see of him, he always has that hand tucked away so you can't see it. But what it meant was because of the deformity to his hand, he could, with a fastball motion, throw a curveball. So he had about a 90 mile an hour curveball. And, and in his prime, he was unhittable because of that. These were semi-pro teams. Few statistics were kept. Elster's 1917 team amassed a 22-3 record. The Fox Jewelry Colored Giants and the Pierre Marquette Colored Giants played a 15-game World Series due to fan demand. Grand Rapids was crazy about baseball. On the weekends, you couldn't find a vacant field of any kind in Grand Rapids because there was a ball game going on of one sort or another. These young guys in the late 20s, early 30s, they wanted to play just baseball. And, and a couple of those teams, you know, they would play a season, 130, 140 games, which is a respectable number of games. But in the 1930s, there were 12 baseball leagues in Grand Rapids, leagues, not teams, leagues of at least four teams per league that were sponsored by merchants, factories, things like that in Grand Rapids. And there was an indoor baseball league that played in Grand Rapids in the 20s, so you could play in the wintertime. By the 1940s, the Grand Rapids Chicks of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League and Class A Minor League Grand Rapids Jets compete for fans who are already following black and white teams from Holland to Muskegon to Kalamazoo and small towns in between, including Benton Harbor's communal colony and its famous Israelite House of David, whose traditions forbade men from shaving or cutting their hair. In the, the late 20s, the Fox Jewelry Company sponsored teams, including a black team. That was one of the teams then that attracted these very young guys who wanted to do nothing but play baseball. And, and Fox sponsored that team for a couple of years. And then the sponsorship went to the Dixie Oil Company, which was located in Lowell, and then to the Finnessy Oil Company. And then after that, the Chicky Candy Bar Company sponsored them in the mid-30s. There was a young guy who worked for the Pierre Marquette Railroad, uh, Clarence Foster, who starts a second black team. So you had at that point basically three teams, Elster's Colored Athletics, the uh, Dixie Colored Giants, they were called, and then the Pierre Marquette Colored Giants. And that was too many teams for the communities to support. 
I played uh, second base, played a little shortstop. I played with the Black Sox when I was in high school. I started playing with the Black Sox and the Grand Rapids Athletics at the age of 15. I was good enough to play with them then, you know. And in high school, you know, um, playing high school ball, you know, it was something different because I'd been playing with the old men's ever since I was 15 years old. I played for the Black Sox until I went to college. Then I came back and was playing for the Black Sox. That's when I went with the Kansas City Monarchs and Detroit Stars after that. As a matter of fact, Herm Green was, my, was the manager at that time. With the Black Sox, I never got paid. With the Stars, I would get a allotment, you know, about 125, 30 a month, something like that, you know. Being a rookie, you didn't get much money. Black Sox was all amateur to me, you know, because I was so young. Well, some guys, they would get food money, like uh, at that time, maybe 350 a meal, you know, that's about it, you know. But food was cheap then too, you know. And out on the road, I would get about 350 a meal. If you loved the game, it paid well to you. If you didn't go to the majors, it wasn't what you wanted to stay in all your life. I was in the barbershop all the time. I used to have a shoe shine stand. Many of the ball players would come down there. So it was an interesting place where a great deal of learning took place. I would learn about how people got jobs, how to keep a job. You learned about different kinds of things people experienced because there are a large number of folk who had come from the South and recent persons into the city. And, uh, you know, survival was an issue. And so you could hear and see how people survive. Well, black people have chronically been underemployed. I mean, in America, that's not anything new. I mean, and had to fight to get in the very industries, the furniture industries. I don't think it was still the 60s that still case hired his first black employee. And so it's this constant push, it's constant struggle to be a part of the, the life of the city. The other thing is that the Chamber of Commerce actively, and sadly to say, pushed against black civil rights in the city. So inclusion in the city was always a struggle, but that's not different than Detroit or Chicago or any other major American city. It's always been a fight. My father had a 55 Oldsmobile and I drove that car to this job site and the owner of the business was outside. And when I, I drove up, he stopped me before I could get into the parking lot. I said, what are you doing? Who are you looking for? And I told him I got this uh, referral for a job. And he said, well, if you're driving a car like that, you don't need a job. I said, oh, it's not, uh, not my car. I said, my father has a barber shop and one of his customers let me use it because it's a long walk from my house here. He said, well, if your daddy got friends like that, with a car like that, you don't need a job. And I was sent on my way. If you had any relation to Ted Raspberry, he pushed school into you. He instrumentally, and uh, I don't know if Henry told you, but I think he was responsible for Henry going to college because he pushed Henry <clears throat> into college. And everybody who came through him he did that. And if you played ball for him, and if he saw any kind of, I mean, where you could do something, he puts education into you. And he did that. That's one great thing about him. Most of these guys that's on the front row were all college, as I was myself. And it was somewhat, not that we felt we were any better, but uh, there was different level or a different line of communication. If we, if we wanted to talk about civil rights, uh, we want to talk about the experiences that, uh, that we had as we were traveling in the South, or if we were, say, for instance, spring training in Birmingham, things were different. And all of these fellows primarily were from the North, as I was. But we were able to, to get along. We knew how to, how, how to communicate. We knew what we had to do. Just listening to the older guys talk and and they talk about life, what to do. And uh, one of the interesting things is that at the time I was playing the Black Sox, I was in college and encouragement, hey, you know, hang in there, stick with it, get your education. 
You can't play baseball all your life and you gotta do something once you get out. What seemed to be going on here in terms of the larger social dynamic is that white America was discovering black America on the baseball field and that in spite of the racial stereotypes, they had to admit that these guys could play baseball well, regardless of their color. It's Elster's team where many of these black leaders of, of the Grand Rapids community first become known to the rest of the community. I was born in 29, 1929. I I uh, remember uh, Captain Walter Cole, the Grand Rapids Police Department. Uh, he spent a lot of time with us, teaching us how to play ball and how to be good, clean, living young men. Walter Cole was in the outfield. They were playing at Island Park, and suddenly the umpire notices that Walter Cole is gone. He's not in the outfield, and he calls time to see what's going on. And it turns out that Walter Coe was looking up in the stands because he was working for the police department, recognized a, a felon who was wanted as a fan. And he jumped the fence and tackled the guy and arrested him. And then waited for other police officers to show up and take him to jail. And then he climbs back over the fence and continues playing the ball game. But you know, he was a police officer too. And, and uh, at that particular moment, his police duties were more important than the baseball game. Attorney Floyd Skinner, whom the Black Bar Association is named after, also played on Elster's team. Maybe this was one of the ways that the wall of discrimination begins to be chipped away at is through baseball. Because, you know, if a person can hit a home run, you can see that. And if that person is black or white, it doesn't matter. But if that individual hits a home run, that person has hit a home run. You have people like Mr. Reuben Smart. Reuben, I say that because affectionately, uh, he is a, one of the, the dear people of my heart, was an ex-Marine, had gone to college, and was just an outstanding baseball player and was coming as a young man to get a start and became one of the great educators of the city. It made your name somewhat familiar in the community, and so that was always a plus. Uh, I mean, like Henry Saverson, I think it helped him. He was uh, first black probation office at the juvenile court. Through my relationship and connection with him, I became the second. We kind of reached back and pulled all the guys along also. When I was playing baseball, I worked for the city and uh, park department for a while. Most of them had jobs at factories, the foundries here, places like that, you know. That's basically the jobs that they had. Other individuals in the black community would arrange jobs for these players. Stanley Barnett was one of them especially who helped him do this. Stanley Barnett had a hotel in downtown Grand Rapids that served black travelers because the white hotels wouldn't accept black travelers. The players lived in the community. You knew them, kids knew them. They walked by, you saw them. Remember players had real jobs, even, even pro players in the 50s. You know, they had to work on off season. Fans packed the stands at Grand Rapids Bigelow and Valley Fields to watch them play. Our best crowds of the season would come out when we played those teams. Yeah, we'd draw a thousand people there at Valley Field, overflow it, you know. Businessman Bob Sullivan sponsored a team in 1952, the Grand Rapids Sullivans. He was also a player manager. They were probably the best team in town, really, you know. At the time, the Black Sox probably had better athletic skills, you know. With the Black Sox played in the evening, you get out 3, 30, 4 o'clock, you hustle home, and uh, you get dressed, and they said the bus was leaving at 6 o'clock. Well, you're there, and you take off and go. Well, at 15, it was experience playing with the older men, because a lot of them was jealous. Here's the 15-year-old to take in my position. They didn't like that, lots of them, you know. And they got used to it, you know, after I started playing, because I could play as well as they could or better. They would teach us appropriate dress. I remember being down at Rumsey Park and, you know, they were kind of messing around on the infield and somebody hit a, one of them one hoppers and you know, I kind of caught it like, and they said, good old cup. And I said, what's a cup? <laughs> Boy, you don't have a cup on? No. So they told me, educated me about that. <laughs> the Black Sox were not exclusive. Bud Chaney, a white player, cracked the lineup. He felt comfortable playing with us. He didn't live that far 
from a neighborhood that we knew and then that we grew up in. A situation, experience that we would never regret because this was a well-disciplined young man at that time by the name of Bud Cheney. He did not mind playing ball with us, uh, although he could have played elsewhere. Bud was a very good, sincere young man, and all of us had a chance to play with him and had a great deal of respect for him, as he had with us. Having a uniform was important because that indicated that you were serious about it, you know, that you weren't a sandlot team. Like an equipment manager, Jess Elster traveled with uniforms outfitting his players. Depending on what the work requirement was, somebody might show up or might not show up. And so he never left home with a, a scorecard where he had the batting order lined up. He had to wait to see who would show up. And then he would hand out uniforms and they would put on uniforms and then play the game. My mother had to help make the uniforms for the Grand Rapids Black Sox. She was a seamstress. Ted bought as many as he could and then she made the rest of them. She had a pattern lay it on the floor and then a sewing machine. And around the legs, they had uh, the elastic, I guess what you call it. And my sister and I would put that in, take a pin and run it around the leg. And that's how you got that. And she would cut the pattern out and then make the buttonholes and we helped sew the buttons on. For the Black Sox, I did the Spoken, I did the contracts, I typed them up. I didn't know how to type, so I used one finger, and I did the calling and paid the player sometimes. I did a little bit of everything. By the time I was 18, I knew all about the ins and outs. Raspberry's nephew, Jimmy Walker, was his right-hand man, running the business side of the organization. We would take the flyers to notify the people of the games. And they also had, they call it a bullhorn back then, where they would go to the neighborhood and announce that Grand Rapids Black Sox playing blah, 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 and Big Low Stadium or whatever. And we would be responsible for getting those out. The Zulu Giants was a black team. I believe they came from Texas, and they came to play the Grand Rapids Black Sox. They came by the house first with their grass skirts on. We laughed. We thought it was funny, but they were very good ball players. They had on their baseball shoes and the socks on and had, of course, shorts under the skirts. They looked like hula dancers. Photo here of uh, my wife, who is from Manistee, of her father, uh, Jesse Owens, and an unidentified ball player. In fact, uh, Ted would take teams north to play, and it was probably during the uh, holiday, July 4th. And I guess Jesse Owens, he was there to race horses and ball players playing ball. And the traveling black aerobatic team, the Flying Nesbits, would also draw a crowd. When the ball players came, they couldn't go to the hotels here in Grand Rapids. They could make the 75-mile trip north to the black resort community of Idlewild or stay at Ted Raspberry's rooming house. Ted's nephew, Jimmy, he had an apartment in the ball house. It was a, a house that uh, Ted owned that the ball players stayed in. Go over there, listen to music, and the ball players would assemble there and Ted then, who Ted was, uh, he knew entertainers and Lambert Hendricks and Ross and Earl Grant and all the music. We just sit and listened to it and, and I remember he got an al album by the Australian Jazz Quintet. Whew. That was interesting because it was some funny sounding music but we said, oh man, that's really, really good. <laughs> They tried to manage to create social lives for themselves and so that where you won't be humiliated publicly. But that was true everywhere. I mean, everybody created clubs around town with civic organizations. So black people had their own version of the Alps. They had their own version of the Masons and uh, fraternities and sororities. And so but that, that was true of every other ethnic group as well. 
we go to the bar and sit around, you know, when we are got free time and talk as a team and everything. But that's, you know, we mingle. And then you get with one or two of them, your best friends, you go out and eat. Then, you know, you go your way and you go yours and we all meet back up. But uh, it was like a family, you know, it was like a family. Negro League Baseball dates back to the turn of the 20th century. Historians trace baseball in the United States back to 1792, where it was played in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. There was a pair of black players, Moses Fleetwood Walker and his brother Welday Walker, who took the field with white teammates. Moses was recruited in 1882 to catch for the University of Michigan baseball team. When the sport formed professional leagues at that time, Team owners conceived an unspoken arrangement known as a gentleman's agreement, barring all non-white players. It's the black press, and there were black newspapers here in Grand Rapids, who are pushing for a black baseball pair. So this is the Pittsburgh Courier, and it's the black press, they're sports writers, the Chicago Defender, these are the two great national papers. They're pushing for a black baseball player. The sports writers are pushing to make sure that baseball integrates. The 60-year prohibition is broken in 1947 when, after playing only one season in the Negro Leagues, Jackie Robinson is signed by Brooklyn Dodgers team president and general manager Branch Rickey. They have their own understanding. He made a verbal agreement with Branch Rickey that in the first couple of years he would not fight back with words or fists and that he, the way he would fight back was his performance on the baseball diamond. And so that was an agreement he made that he stuck with. And um, as soon as Branch Rickey released him from that, you know, he was very verbal, he was outspoken, he was, you know, more himself. Three months after Robinson integrates the National League, Larry Doby signs with the American League's Cleveland Indians. The introduction of black players was slow major leagues putting in place a quota limit of two African Americans per roster. Once integration comes along, then the good players can get on the white teams, and then suddenly you don't need black teams anymore. Because the owners of these teams were selling their franchises because the color barrier had been broken, and they saw that as the economic end of what they were doing. Black baseball, like white baseball, was a commercial enterprise. They were trying to make a little money at it. At that point, once integration comes along, that was in jeopardy for these black entrepreneurs. And Raspberry tries to keep it going, and does so until about 1960-61. He purchases the Detroit Stars in 1953, bringing them into the Negro American League. He would do the same with the Kansas City Monarchs in 1955. The league was fading out and he was trying his best to keep the league going. He didn't want all the teams to just fade. He had a desire to have the Kansas City Monarchs, but he had purchased the Detroit Stars first. Then when they were selling the Kansas City Monarchs and he wanted them for the name, I think. And at that time, it was only two other teams that were still holding on. And that was the Birmingham Black Barons and the Chicago American Giants. So it was just the four teams that was in the league. He was informed by the league that he couldn't own two teams in the league because that meant that he would be monopolizing the whole league. He said, baby, how would you like to own a team in the major league? I didn't know what team he was talking about. I thought he was talking about one of the other teams with all these guys on there. And I said, sure. So then he said, well, what about the Kansas City Monarchs out of Detroit Star? And then he said, just kidding, not the Monarchs. <laughs> So that leaves the stars, and I said, oh yeah, because I knew most of the guys on the team, I knew the manager, and uh, he wanted to keep it in the family. Well, I think it's incredible that Minnie's uncle had such foresight to entrust a baseball team to his niece. I think that's quite amazing, that, and then she was able to hold the mantle together and run the team. I think it's a very courageous story and, a, and um, a very inspirational story at the same time. 
an African-American woman owning a black baseball team during the turbulent 1950s. She's in a transition time also when the Negro Leagues are threatened. This is a business, so she must have had to struggle with bringing in the amount of money they need and keeping the players when they're now able to go into the major leagues, and that really would be the route they'd want to go. It was a struggle very much like the black hospitals you know, or black doctors during those times. I mean, all those people had risen up to a certain level. And then when integration happened, um, that meant the doors were open and people had choices. I played second base. There were other players who actually, you know, went on to become signed by the major leagues. One disadvantage for me was that when I had come to the point where if there was a possibility of being considered as a major league team prospect, I reached a point where I was too old. If they're looking at you to sign you, you, you're about two or three years younger, no matter what. So some of the guys, they went in there and they might have been 30, they were 33. But we never used the right age. You know, I remember when Ike Brown went up, you know, I don't know how old White was when he went to the Tigers, but he was a good one, you know. And then we had some to sign. For instance, Reuben Smart, he signed eventually with uh, the Cleveland Indians. He made it as far as AAA, and he was just that far uh, an inch away from getting into the majors. You know, he was that good, you know. Very quick, very quick and sure hands, great hands, and he could do anything with the bat. You know, they, they pull those shifts on hitters today. I wish they did that when I was hitting or when Ruben was hitting. One thing we had very much in common, we both used a bottle bat. Neither one of us hit for a lot of power, but we could handle a bat very good. And uh, Ruben is like I am. I would put the hit and run with him at bat all the time. I knew that he was going to get a, at least a piece of the ball. Other players with major league potential included captain and coach Jake Robertson, Herm Green, Sammy Robinson, Olin Jelly Taylor, Ray Miller, Eddie Perry, Joe Smith, Herman Purcell, Willie Lee, Bob James, and strong-armed and accurate throwing catcher Ray Richardson. I grew up in, in the game. You know, I scouted for the Tigers for 36 years. I enjoyed all those years and just loved the game. They had some great players, no question about it. You know, it's a shame that the uh, major leagues took so long to accept them. I know some of the players was upset about it, but the way things was, I guess it wasn't anything to be done until 47. But all those players, better and they played for less and uh, it was just unfortunate that it was that way. The Society for American Baseball Research found black players first accounted for 10 percent of rosters in 1958. The Boston Red Sox were the last team to integrate, adding a black player to its roster in 1969. The Negro League continued on. Raspberry's Detroit Stars spring training home was Birmingham, Alabama. I played as well as being a traveling secretary and, and made sure that these players got their eating money and that they got the money that they had earned. Keep ball players happy and pleased, then you'll get production. Traveling through the South in 1955 proved difficult amid growing racial tension just traveling and seeing different people all the time, you know. You're not going to see the same person in the same town. In one town, you get a real smooth feeling. One town, you ain't nothing but a Negro. They call it nigger, you know. But that's what it was, you know, and you knew you was going to get that. You just kept on moving, you know, and you, you, you didn't let that bother you. I didn't have any fear of the South. It didn't bother me because I grew up in it. Naomi and Henry Saverson married in 1954. Oh, yes, I missed him. Great. Sure, I missed him. Yeah, I missed him. Mm-hmm, I missed him. 
It was about a year when we got married when he was uh, traveling in the South. 1955 is the same year Emmett Till, a 14-year-old from Chicago, while visiting family in Money, Alabama, is tortured and lynched by two white men, alleging Till was flirting with a white cashier. Later that year, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her bus seat to a white man. It would trigger the Montgomery bus boycott. I can remember in Memphis in particular, I mean, there were at least two or three incidents such as that. I mean, there was a constant uh, fear of that in terms of what could happen because we did have a few incidents where some white young fellows got on the bus and more or less uh, challenged us. Something about uh, where do we think we were going, what we were doing, what well, made you think you could play baseball, you know, questions like that. Uh, they weren't threatening but uh, challenging, as far as we're concerned, uncalled for. We were not going to react to that, that sort of stuff. He would call me just about every evening. I would get a telephone call from him after we got married. Well, he never told me something that would frighten me about anything uh, than when he was playing uh, baseball in his South. He told me things that happened, but nothing that, anything that feared him so that he would tell me that I would make me fear. And the fact that you only had four teams, you know, is indicative of the change that had occurred. Uh, and, uh, you know, guys were getting signed to play in the professional leagues. With talent declining, Raspberry signed players young and old filling out his rosters, including Tony Stone, the first of three women to play in the Negro Leagues. She had joined the Indianapolis Clowns in 1953, later traded to the Monarchs. Before the league folds, Raspberry's teams hit the road barnstorming. On occasion, Ted would take us out on the road, and we would dress as Detroit Stars or Kansas City Monarchs. Did not play in the league, but we suited up as Detroit Stars or Kansas City Monarchs. You may not know everybody on the team because it would not be everybody on the Black Sox, it would be a few and then there's some others and you go into a city, you play, and then you leave. They played against my team many times. So I knew, you know, their lifestyle and how tough it was for them, especially when it was 90 degrees and they had buses that weren't air conditioning and have to go from town to town and play every day. They never had off days, you know, they were scheduled every day. A lot of times would get their uniforms washed and have to wear them wet. I know that, I remember that. It was decent crowds, but not great crowds, because I think at that particular time, the Negro le uh, League was dissipating. That was interest, but not as it uh, had been at one time. One draw was aging all-star pitcher Satchel Page, who took the mound for Raspberry's teams. He played with the uh, Kansas City Monarchs and the Detroit Stars. They played here, they played at Valley Field against Sully, Bob Sullivan's team. Yeah, he came here, you know, and uh, he played a couple of games here. I can remember many times batting against Satchel Page. In one game, I let off and I hit the first pitch of the game, line drive right past his ear. <laughs> but uh, I remember the times where we drew great crowds with Satchel pitching against us. And uh, remember one Sunday in particular where Satchel was supposed to start the game and he was nowhere in sight and they were all looking for him and somebody told, they left him off at Reed's Lake to go fishing early in the morning. So they went out there and found him fishing. <laughs> Yet after the second or third inning, he got there in the fourth or fifth inning and pitched the rest of the game. The Dorsey brother and I, we, you know, we just kind of sit there and look down at him because he was such a legend. And he said, I'm going to take you uh, young bucks down here and show you something. <laughs> and he took out a gum wrapper, put it on the ground. He said, seven out of ten curveballs over that gum wrapper. And he did it. I said, wow. Matter of fact, when I went out with the Kansas City Monarchs, he took me and told me, set me at home plate and put a napkin down and told me to hold your glove there. 
I'm going to hit it three times in a row. I'm going to show you why I'm the greatest. He did that. From that day on, it was like, hey, he's the guy. He's the guy. He came to Grand Rapids to talk to my uncle, and I was in the office still doing some paperwork. He sat in there a while, and uh, we talked, and you know how guys flirt and carry on. And it was just a joke. He said, how about if I marry you and take you back with me? And Ted just came around the door when he was saying that, and he said, it's time for you to go. <laughs> so we always laugh about that. I said, I could have married Satchel Paige. <laughs> talk about something miraculous. He didn't pitch in the big leagues till he was 50. Didn't start in the big leagues till he was 50. And then was successful and lasted a few years. Is that remarkable or what? Attendance and interest was waning. Like most team owners, Raspberry sought alternatives for generating revenue to support his team. He did get involved in numbers running, but that really does a disservice. But Raspberry and others tried to keep the Negro National League's major leagues going for a while, but by 1961 they have to give it up because people aren't coming to, to watch the games anymore because they can watch it on television. I was one of the first ones to have black players play for me. You know, I had as many as three or four, or four black players most of the time play on my team. After they disbanded, I got some of his better players, you know, which really helped my team. Reuben Smart and Ray Miller, Willie Lee, two of them end up as employees for me. We won the city championship and all the years, but probably three or four, we won the state championship. And then we won uh, three national championships in Wichita, Kansas. And we won two world championships in, in Europe. Every kid in Grand Rapids of a certain age or now adult, middle age and over will tell you How'd you learn baseball? Ted Raspberry coaching out in the park somewhere, um, umping a game, um, uh, teaching young people about the game. And so those kinds of people are missing today. So beloved, family, former players, and the Grand Rapids community rededicated Ted Raspberry Field in 2016. Wonderful person, gregarious, smile, one of the most pleasant persons you'd ever meet. You know, from probably 1948 to 1960, those 12 years, worked very, very hard to try to keep black baseball as a viable economic and sports institution. Uh, unsuccessfully, of course, because of integration. He knew how one could help themselves if they lived good, clean, athletic, inspired life. I looked up to him. He would give you an opportunity to, pr to prove yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, how are you? It's Negro Leg Day here at Comerica Park. Woo! For the players, it, it helped them to feel like they are not forgotten and then it helps them to meet players that they played with years ago. And it's just a good feeling, the fellowship, to look forward to seeing players from one year to the next, if they are able to make it. And for the people, it's educational to them because there are so many of the young generation that have no idea what the Negro players are about and what they had to go through to play. These are guys that, and ladies that have created American history, not black history, but American history, changed the game. We don't think that maybe some of the memories that they may have may hurt too bad to even talk about, you know? We would never know the full ramifications of what they really felt because we weren't there. These guys did this 60 years ago, and what they went through was just a chance to play baseball. and. Now that you come up to us and man, I want to interview you. For what? I ain't did nothing. But they had. And you have to point it out, particularly Mrs. Ford. You have to point it out what she did. And 
When you bring it up, she'll say, oh, I did do that, did it, but I just didn't think nothing about it. You see the president on TV and you never would have thought that I would get an opportunity to go to the White House. It was wonderful. He kissed me on the cheek and uh, almost fainted. He said how proud he was of the Negro players at that time. It's uh, something great, a part of my history and that I wasn't as humble after I got kissed by the president as I was before. I, I consider it an honor to be a part of that and uh, I'm very proud of uh, the, the Negro were able to accomplish in the, in the league. So many of them just con continue to improve. I grew up loving baseball. Playing the game in the Negro League it was really the love for the game to a lots of us because, hey, we wasn't going to get rich. But we loved the game so much, we was going to play it. 